here we are once again and uh today we've got a couple of uh, special guests who uh probably don't need any introduction whatsoever but uh I, I think i will anyway because they're such a couple of special guys you probably recognize them i'll talk about the older one first he's a little he's shorter but he's older that's been that has been discussed this <laughs> numerous times over the years i got a high chair <laughs> I give a booster <laughs> so, so on our right is Derek Johnson. On the left is his his little brother, Mitch Johnson, and uh, they're joining us uh, today to talk about uh, all of us. Uh, their dad, of course, Dick, who uh, was so much a part of Riverton music, and uh, we all have some stories to to share and and tell about that. I'm going to start a little bit by just saying that you know we uh, this thing we have called Riverton music. Uh, it, it goes back a lot of years, a lot of decades, probably uh, 70, 80 years really since the beginning of what we have kind of defined as, uh, as Riverton music. And uh, this is only my opinion, but I'm going to say that in the last 40 to 50 years, no single individual did more to carry on the tradition and to cultivate that culture of pride for Riverton music. There's no single person who did more than Dick. Because as a, as a youngster, a teenager, he went and was happy to go and play in his mom's band. The Musical Mates did that for years. Then he went and joined up with Lorne Martin from Husevik, and they started a, a band called Retreat, which entertained in dances and so on for years and years and years. Uh, then, of course, it was on to the, the, point, the fine country folk days, uh, following that cool water, and following that um, the homebrew line. And in between all of those little ventures, he was, of course, a, an incredible mentor for the uh, fine country kids, for the musical pals, for the musical gals. And then, uh, you know, I just mentioned Homebrew Line. Besides being a part of the band, he was the driving force behind everything that in his mind was important for these kids to learn, which was practice, practice, practice. And that's how you're going to get good, and that's how you're going to get your most enjoyment out of music. That was what Dick was all about. And on, besides the bands, think of all the shows we put on. W without Dick, those wouldn't have happened. Uh, starting with the 94 show, the celebrating the, uh, the uh, Hootenannies, the 30th anniversary Hootenanny reunion in 94, the Hootenanny in Gimel in 97, uh, the tribute we did to Cliff Lindstrom. I'm, I'm not sure now what year that was. The tribute to the musical mates in 2011, uh, the tribute to Lauren Martin, his dear friend, and also celebrating his... Uh, our uh, our great friend uh, here, Roy, uh, and then of course in 2017, the uh, for Canada 150, we put on the big show uh, celebrating Riverton music uh, at the Riverton Hall. None of those could have, would have happened without Dick. Uh, first of all, because I know I never would have bothered to get involved without knowing that he was going to be by my side and and knowing that Wes was going to be uh, at our side as well. Uh, just because, and uh, uh, he, he made all those things happen. And so if you as a viewer of these little programs, if, uh, if every time you hear the words Riverton Music and it brings a sense of pride to you, you owe a debt of gratitude to Dick Johnson. That, that's my first opinion, and, uh, and I, really, uh, I really hope you agree. Well, Dick and I sure had a very uh, special relationship uh, both as uh, really really good friends but um, that all got cemented by our mutual love of music and having the opportunity to play together and to work in the studio together uh, it was a relationship like no other for me dick was a special, special talent. He was a tremendous bass player, uh, piano player, obviously, but he was also a really good acoustic and lead guitar player. And not to forget uh, one of the most beautiful voices, a uh, beautiful tenor voice, a talent for singing harmonies like nobody I've ever met. Uh, I know this may not mean much to a lot of people, but uh, Dick had uh, as close to perfect pitch 
as any musician I've ever known in my life, and I've known a lot. What perfect pitch means, if you don't know, is that when you aim for the note, you nail it. You're not a little above, you're not a little below, you're right totally on tune with the note. And something that a lot of people may not know is that Dick was partially deaf in his right ear. Uh, I think he only had about 50% of his hearing. If you're a musician and you're, uh, you know, recording music and you're, uh, and you're heavily involved in the whole audio end of things, uh, mm -hmm. having a handicap like not being able to hear at 100% uh, well, certainly would be a handicap for some people, myself included. But with uh, with Dick, uh, it just didn't seem to 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 register in any way, uh, in a negative way. Amazing, amazing, amazing fellow. And uh, uh, like I said, we we got to be such good friends uh, uh, through music, primarily. Uh, Dick was four years younger than me, and uh, so I didn't really start hanging with Dick until probably the early 80s after I moved back from Toronto. Um, but anyway, we we uh, we just got along famously. I wanted I wanted to also um, talk a little bit about um, his ability as a songwriter and a composer. I think Rod has a few stories that he'll uh, mention uh, in this regard in a bit here, but I wanted to um, point out in particular Dick's piano instrumental song uh, called In the Distance. Uh, that was the final title that he came up with. It was a melody that was rolling around in Dick's head for a while. Uh, and one night he just uh, decided that's it. I'm, I'm going to go into the studio. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to record this. Uh, I don't want to forget it. So that he did. And basically recorded the whole thing over a, a couple of hours. Um, I kind of came in at that point after uh, uh, the song was, was pretty much recorded on tape. And uh, he had uh, added uh, some uh, beautiful uh, synthesizer string effects on it to kind of give it a lushness. Um, it was an extremely wistful kind of tune, a very almost melancholy in a sense. But we started listening to it after he had done these overdubs and so on. And we, we both felt that the song was missing something that we didn't really know what it was. And uh, in the end, um, I happened to mention Paul McCartney's Mull of Kintyre, uh, where uh, Paul McCartney had used bagpipes on the song, and I thought it uh, was absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, it kind of triggered for Dick as well. And we decided, well, hey, we've got nothing to lose. What if we put some bagpipes on this? The danger in that, of course, is that for a lot of people, bagpipes is like fingernails scratching on a blackboard. And uh, <laughs> so we had to be careful with that. But anyway, I found a, a, play, a bagpipe player in Winnipeg. He was just a, basically a pretty young kid. Played with one of the pipe bands there. Brought him out to Riverton. And uh, we re we recorded him, and um, it was it was interesting because you know we had never recorded bagpipes before, and then we realized, well, it's not quite sounding like you know the the big skirl of you know twenty bagpipers uh, playing at the same time. So we kept recording them over and over and over again. I think we had about eight tracks uh, off him doing uh, the bagpipes on the tune. And when all was said and done, we just kind of looked at each other. We knew that uh, the pipes were the icing on the cake. 